So I would like to uh, invite our next speaker uh, to close this session. Uh, it is really uh, with great excitement that we uh, invite uh, uh, Prof. Hughes Defoe. Uh, he's the professor and chair uh, of the Montpellier uh, Neurosurgery Department and one of the uh, clinical and the clinical lead, in fact, of the Inserm uh, 1191 team. He has multiple accolades as well as uh, multiple awards, and to date, I think he's still the youngest recipient of the. Herbert Olive Krona Award from the Karolinska Institute. Um, Professor Defoe is an expert uh, in uh, awake cognitive neurosurgery for slow-growing brain tumors, and we really are very privileged uh, to pick his brain on what his thoughts are in terms of MRI screening for low-grade gliomas. Sorry, um, Prof. Defoe, please. Online, joining online. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. we can hear you. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and for giving me this uh, unique opportunity uh, to uh, speak about uh, my experience uh, in the field of uh, surgery for low grade glioma, uh, so brain tumors, and especially in the field uh, of uh, asymptomatic patients. To make a long history short, uh, I would like to summarize the fact that uh, when I started, uh, the survival was around uh, five to six years, and now uh, we reached more than 17 years of uh, overall survival, while the quality of life uh, is preserved in 99% of patients. So that means that uh, we really increased both the happiness of patients and uh, the lung of uh, survival to make long-term project. How we reached these uh, uh, results, first of all, by doing early surgery, uh, when I started, uh, uh, the tradition was wait and see. Of course, uh, it should be abundant to do a maximization. So to try to take a margin around the tumor, which is not uh, as uh, 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 different in comparison with uh, other organs, uh, but we are speaking about the brain, and then to do a safe realization. And this is the reason why we decided uh, to better understand the brain function, what we call the connectome. Indeed, uh, uh, when you diagnose low-grade glioma, if uh, uh, the uh, tumor is bigger, then the risk uh, to see malignant transformation of this tumor is higher. But we know also that if the tumor is growing faster, then uh, the risk to see uh, um, death more quickly is higher. So this is the reason why we started systematically to calculate the volume and the kinetics of the tumor before to go to the operating theater. And of course, to integrate the nature of the tumor, especially the advances in molecular biology, but by telling that uh, even in poor patterns of molecular biology, you can have a very good prognosis and vice versa. In other words, uh, when we speak about uh, wide type uh, uh, low grade glioma, in my experience, it's not uh, a glioblastoma like uh, in 80% of cases, because you can see that if you do a very extensive resection, then uh, the median survival can be very long. In other words, so the molecular biology is just, is just a part of the history and not uh, the absolute truth. Definitely, when I started, you can see the median survival 20, 25 years ago. And now we published a lot of paper demonstrating that uh, uh, with uh, early maximalization and, of course, safe resection, uh, which I will develop during this talk, then uh, um, the median survival uh, is uh, uh, above uh, uh, 17 years, but also with this preservation of the quality of life, which is absolutely critical, of course. On the other hand, we have to be careful by uh, uh, telling that patient is normal. Indeed, uh, if you do an extensive uh, uh, neuropsychological assessment at diagnosis, which is made uh, in the vast majority of cases uh, because of uh, seizures, then uh, in more, more than 50% uh, uh, cases, the patients are not so well, they can have uh, some degrees of cognitive deficit. And these deficits are related to the invasion by the glioma of uh, what we call the connectivity, namely the white matter tracts. So we have to preserve this connectivity when we do surgery because the goal is not to remove a tumor mass within the brain, but to remove a part of the brain invaded by a chronic disease. 
so to do lobectomy. This is the reason why we have to understand the individual functional anatomy because we have not the same brain. Indeed, this uh, tumor likes uh, to be located within so-called eloquent areas according to a localizationist view of the brain, namely one area corresponding to one function. And I will demonstrate to you that uh, this uh, classical dogma is totally wrong. Fortunately for our patients, of course, namely it's possible to remove uh, the broca's area without inducing any language deficit. Indeed, we have understood that uh, the brain is uh, processing uh, thanks to a networking framework uh, and uh, uh, the goal for neuroscience is also to be a neuroscientist in order to develop new model of cognition based on the observation and performed directly into the operating theater every week. So we can use a functional neuroimaging before and after surgery, which is a very good didactic tool, but at the individual level, be careful because a uh, functional neuroimaging is not the absolute truth. For instance, tractography is not the function, but just a movement of water molecule. So this is the reason why we decided 25 years ago to do systematically a way mapping with uh, uh, transitory deficits elicited by uh, uh, electrical stimulation, as you can see on the screen, and uh, not only at the level of the cortex, but also by doing a mapping of the white matter tracts, the limitation of neuroplasticity, namely the mechanisms of compensation when you have a brain tumor and or when you do a lobectomy in order to preserve this quality of life. So to elaborate the tasks into the operating theater, then we have to take care uh, uh, of the quality of life defined by the patient himself or herself. Of course, they do not want to be aphasic hemiplegic, but it's not enough to preserve a normal life according to the job, the hobby or the environment. And uh, because I received patients coming from the five continents, um, including from, from Asia, of course, you can imagine that the culture, the language, uh, and uh, the socioeconomic parameters are not the same. And we have to take care about that in order to elaborate a real you know, psychological assessment into the operating theater online throughout the resection, but also to preserve so the connectivity and especially the projection and the association fibers. If you cut these fibers, then you will disconnect two thirds of the hemisphere and the patient will not recover. So um, I do not use technology into the operating theater. No neural navigation, no DTI, no fMRI, no intraoperative MRI, no robot, no microscope. And my goal is to try to better understand the connectome of this patient at that time and I have the regret, the regret to tell you that technology today will not give you this uh, individual information with a high level of accuracy, namely what is critical to preserve for the patient to recover. And this is the reason why I do not understand why uh, the patients are not systematically awake when you do this kind of uh, resection, I mean a part of the brain itself, Namely, the classical dogma, according to localizationism, is to say the left hemisphere is critical, dominant, the right hemisphere is non-dominant. To do this talk today, I need my both hemispheres because this is a brain. So in the right so-called non-dominant hemisphere, in fact, this hemisphere is critical for cognition, especially social cognition, spatial cognition to drive semantics, executive functions to do many things simultaneously, but also for emotional processing, personality. So you see that is beyond the fact that we would like to avoid aphasia hemiplegia. Indeed, when we are totally objective, not only before surgery, during surgery, but after surgery, some uh, patients continue to exhibit some degrees of uh, cognitive deficit regarding, for instance, uh, uh, the working memory, the attentional processing and so on. So we decided to do wake mapping, as I said, but by uh, combining many tasks simultaneously, moving, speaking, combining, self-evaluating, and so on. And to do that every four seconds into the operating theater without any rest. So that means that you have a monitoring also of sustained attention 
in two to three hours. So just the timing to remove very big tumors within the brain. This is true for movement control, for instance, as you can see, when you stimulate one pathways, then the patient will block movement bilaterally. Why it is important? Because that means that uh, if you cut this pathway, then the patient will have difficulties to do complex movement. This is true also to avoid any neglect. If you are a dancer, but just if you want to drive, you need also to have a perfect awareness of the environment. And you can publish in science why um, being very helpful for the patient. More recently, we published in Nature Communications the network involved in at visuospatial attentional processing. And definitely, this is to better preserve the quality of life of the patient while increasing the extent of resation according to functional boundaries. This is true for language. We demonstrated that definitely Broca's area does not exist, is not the area of speech. This is true in France, this is true in US, this is true in Asia, especially in China. So speaking about language, uh, we have different pathways and I will not insist about that, but uh, uh, some pathways involved, uh, the involved in uh, the understanding, semantics, other pathways uh, involved in phonological articulatory processing, allowing speech, and everything is interconnected. We demonstrated definitely the critical role of the right so-called non-dominant hemisphere, especially for semantics, understanding the environment and the, and the world around us, which is of course critical in order to have adapted behavior. And we also preserved the uh, emotional processing, the personality, the mood, especially by uh, mapping, uh, monitoring uh, the capacities for patients to recognize the emotion expressed by faces in front of them directly into the operating theater while we are rejecting the vast majority of the glioma. And so the results speaking about uh, now the oncological issues. About uh, almost 1,000 diffuse glioma, while this is a very rare disease, including patients with uh, tumors located within so-called eloquent areas, the Wernicke's area, the Broca's area, the corpus callosum, and so on. The mortality in my experience is zero in a prospective collection of data because they have a good team. The risk zero does not exist, but the risk to induce a severe permanent deficit is less than 1%. So more than 99% of patients return to a normal life. With 86% of cognitive preservation plus 10% of cognitive improvement, 94 patients return to work with a, a positive impact on epilepsy. Remember the vast majority of patients had a diagnosis because of uh, epilepsy in 80% of patients. So with an improvement of the quality of life. Indeed, we have understood that uh, the epilepsy is related not to the core of the tumor, but the periphery of the tumor. So the infiltration of the disease. This tumor is uh, an invasive tumor. This is not a tumor mass pushing the brain. So we have to remove the brain itself. And definitely you can tell me, yes, by doing so many tasks into the OR, you have a risk of oncologically speaking uh, to decrease the extent of resection and your patient will not, will not live so longer. This is the reverse. Now I will reach 80 years. Each year we continue in this prospective collection of data to increase the median survival. And definitely, I would like to insist on the fact that the impact of surgery is per se and not related to a selected subgroup of patients with a better molecular profile. This is even the reverse. You can tell me also, yes, but it's not possible to remove completely all tumors because they can invade some critical networks uh, involved in as we have seen in movement control, language, cognition, emotion, and so on. That's true. But because neoplasticity exists, then I will come back and to reoperate the patient a few years later, 
while he's enjoying a normal life and I will remove more brain tumor because in the meantime, the networks reorganized. This is true here for the knob of the hand while the patient is able to play guitar. Or this is true here for Wernicke's area. You see that uh, during the first surgery, it was not possible to remove it. It was still critical, but 10 years later, it was uh, totally reorganized. Or in this case, uh, you can imagine that the bilateral lobectomy, uh, speaking about the frontal lobe, and I can tell you that patient is still alive and enjoying normal life by driving, working, taking care of the family with uh, three hours of cognitive and emotional monitoring after surgery. So, I published uh, recently the sole paper in the literature demonstrating that it was possible to operate three times patients before malignant transformation, so with uh, diffuse low grade glioma, enjoying a normal life, and then pushing this median survival now around 18 years. Remember, when I started, it was around six to seven years, 20 years ago. And we did also cognitive assessment after re-operation in order to be sure that uh, we will continue uh, to preserve not only cognition, but of course, behavior and normal life, including return to work. The problem in this tumor, as I said, is that uh, uh, low-grade glioma diffuse tumors. They are not a tumor mass. They are not well delineated. So the goal now is to better understand, not only to remove the core, as you understood, of course, but the peritumoral zone, as you do, for instance, uh, uh, in other organs, but definitely this is the brain. Yes, but we are protected thanks to wake mapping with uh, cognitive monitoring. So we decided uh, to go beyond what uh, we can see on the preoperative MRI and to do a supratotal resection which is probably not a scoop uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, the lung, but which is really a scoop speaking about the brain. And we changed radically the natural history of the disease by avoiding malignant transformation and then death by doing that within the brain, once again, by preserving the function. And this is the reason why I insisted first today on the preservation of the quality of life, because uh, now the goal is to show you that we removed beyond what we can, we can see on the preoperative MRI, which is not the absolutely the absolute truth concerning the oncological issues. And definitely we change radically the natural history of the disease with 20 years of follow-up now. And this is the reason why colleagues have said, yes, but it's not possible to do supratotalization in all cases, especially when the tumor is already too big a diagnosis. Then we decided to do preventive neurosurgery by removing incidental discovered low-grade glioma, I mean a patient without any symptoms for brain injury, for instance, so you have an MRI or because of headaches and so on, and to develop a policy of screening. On the other hand, because they have a brain tumor, if you are totally objective and if you do a preoperative cognitive assessment in incidental discovery of asymptomatic patient, in fact, they are not asymptomatic. They have some degrees of uh, complaints and uh, uh, mm, some degrees of uh, cognitive deterioration in approximately half of people. If we are doing nothing, the tumor will grow and we have definitely to calculate the growth rate, as I said initially, in order to be sure that we will not remove an imagine, but uh, remove uh, a real tumor growing. On the other hand, if we wait too much, wait and see, then that the tumor will continue to grow and will become malignant, even if in uh, even in uh, asymptomatic patients or incidental discovery. You understand why I would prefer to uh, use the term incidental discovery rather than asymptomatic. They are not totally asymptomatic. Typically. This patient was followed uh, because incidental discovery and uh, the patient continued to enjoy a normal life in another uh, hospital in another country and one day the tumor become really became a uh, uh, high-grade glioma. 
And at that time, the patient was, was referred to me. And of course, I removed the glioblastoma, secondary glioblastoma, but it was too late. So this is the reason why we said now we have to operate earlier. And even if the patient has no symptom according to his view, then we will change radically in the natural history of the disease. It's exactly what happened. Indeed, uh, we increased very significantly the rate of total and supratotalization, and we preserved the quality of life uh, in 100% of patients, more than 99% in all cases. And we reproduced recently the results, not only from Montpellier, but also from UCSF, uh, San Francisco, but also Italy and uh, Canada. And you can see the 10 year survival now is 93%. So we changed radically the natural history of the disease. Remember initially half of patients died after six years. And definitely we demonstrated that we preserved the quality of life even after supratotalization, even after uh, resection, supratotalization in incidental discovery of diffuse low grade glioma. And in this subgroup, 97% of patients were able to return to work. So you see it's a real preservation of the quality of life. Why 20 years ago, the dogma was uh, if you operate the brain, you will induce a severe permanent deficit. You can forget. It. And this is the reason why. So we proposed a policy of screening, at least in France, in front of uh, the Academy, National Academy of Medicine, a few years ago, and it has been accepted. And I started to discover, to discover some tumor without any symptoms in patients who would like intentionally to be sure that they have no any brain tumor, for instance, because uh, the father died uh, from a glioblastoma in the family. And when we asked uh, to uh, um, students in medicine, uh, if they would like to uh, participate in an MRI program of screening, then uh, you can see the answer. They accepted in 66% of cases. Definitely, you can achieve these results only if uh, you know the limitation of brain plasticity. And this is true for neurosurgeons, but it should be true also for radiotherapists, because if you irradiate too early the brain at the level of the periphery of the surgical cavity, so the limitation of neuroplasticity, then you have a risk to induce cognitive deficits. So if you cannot re re, -re operate patients because invasion of the connectivity, especially in the contralateral hemisphere, then please do chemotherapy first, which will preserve the quality of life, especially the cognition. And then we developed new model, not only of cognitive, uh, uh, um, um, in the field of cognitive neuroscience, but also in your oncology by telling, first of all, do an extensive resection, earlier supratotone according to functional boundaries, then induce plasticity, especially by doing postoperative cognitive assessment and rehabilitation, and to push the patient to return to work, and you will come back in a few years before malignant transformation. If you cannot do uh, a chemotherapy, and finally, if you cannot, after 10 to 15 years, please irradiate the patient at that time. And definitely that works, the results I show you initially. So the conclusion is that you cannot operate the brain if you do not understand the functional anatomy of the brain. But in the classical teaching everywhere in the world today, what we teach is totally wrong. So we have now to build new atlas of functional anatomy. It's exactly what we did recently to help younger people to better operate the brain, not only for low-grade glioma, but also high-grade metastasis, epilepsy surgery, stimulation surgery, DBS, and so on. And now we have to understand really that uh, there are so many interactions between networks and between hemispheres. So this is what we called the meta-networking brain, the interplay across circuits, explaining why we are human beings able to adapt to the environment and we can use this model in order to better understand what we are doing during the transitory stimulation into the operating theater, both at the level of the cortex and the wire matter tracks. The conclusion is that 
when we are into the brain of patient to remove glioma, we have to forget the tumor, which does not exist as a tumor mass, but to talk to the brain. And then we have to be careful about technology because technology is not able to find so many information in comparison to the feedback provided by the human being directly into the OR thanks to uh, real-time cognitive assessment. So now we know that we have the choice or just to be oncologist or to treat a patient according to his wishes in order to improve not only the oncological results but also the functional issues. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Prof, for the wonderful uh, lecture. The floor is now open for the, the question and answer. I'm sorry, because it seems that the video does not work while uh, everything is uh, uh, okay uh, here. So uh, I do not understand why, but the most important is, of course, the message uh, rather than my face. So no, <laughs> no mentalizing today. Sorry. Thank you, Prof. Sorry, Prof. Yu. Uh, morning, Prof. Dufo. Yeah, Prof. Yu here. Sorry to wake you up so early in the morning to give this lecture in Montpellier. <laughs> uh, just want to ask about your screening. You know, so uh, is it sort of reasonable to screen huge populations? Because I guess the the incidence of low grade gliomas is, is generally pretty low. So, if we were to launch uh, such a program nationwide, do you think it's uh, cost effective? We thought, of course, about that. Uh, otherwise, it, uh, um, no way to be accepted by the National Academy of Medicine uh, and or to be published in cancer. So first of all, we selected patients initially between 20 and 40 because we know that uh, if we would like to identify possible uh, diffuse low grade glioma, it's very frequent uh, in uh, younger adults. Second, we know that uh, we have just uh, to do a flare sequence, uh, so uh, it's not a complete MRI, of course, to screen. You have not uh, to do the DTI, the fMRI, uh, you have not uh, to enhance the uh, MRI, so it's very short. Third, uh, and there are now, uh, um, uh, thanks to artificial intelligence, uh, software able uh, to detect uh, uh, um, MRIs uh, which are not normal. And then, of course, we will analyze just a subset of uh, MRI, while the vast majority will be uh, considered as normal by uh, uh, the algorithm. So it's not uh, um, so expensive. Fourth, uh, if uh, we identify the low grade lima, of course, the goal will be to remove it uh, and uh, to give the opportunity for the patient to live more or less in this subgroup uh, uh, 20 years. So that means that because the patient will be active, in fact, uh, it will be not so cost effective if we think about the next 20 years of the population of patients with uh, uh, gliomas rather than to have a risk to see malignant transformation, to be under radiotherapy, chemotherapy very expensive, not working, and so on. Fifth, we can also detect something else, like an aneurysm, for instance, or multiple sclerosis, and so on. And then the goal is not just to do a screening for uh, the low-grade glioma, because it's rare, as I said, and uh, you say that uh, the uh, um, um, uh, prevalence uh, is very low, but uh, also to detect something else uh, very helpful for other fields of neurology. And then we can refer, of course, the patient to a specialist in multiple sclerosis, why, in fact, it was not a low-grade glioma, and we have no reason to operate here. And if you put everything all together, Finally, we demonstrated that after four years of normal life, specifically regarding patients with diffuse low-grade glioma, additional life, then finally the cost is compensated. Are there any more questions on the... Yes, please.
Uh, hi, Prof. Um, Katia here. <clears throat> Thanks for giving us such an amazing talk. I have two questions. Um, the first question is for patients where you do not achieve supratotal resection for low grades um, because of um, eloquent areas. Uh, how long do you wait for plasticity to, to set in before going in again? And the second question is for patients with uh, unresectable tumors from the onset. Uh, you mentioned about giving chemotherapy to, to, to shrink the tumor and, and how long uh, you give this chemotherapy for uh, before you consider a surgical resection. Thanks. Thinking about uh, the second question first, um, really depends on the observation. I mean, uh, as you know, each patient is uh, different. So when uh, uh, we have a gliomatosis like, and we know that it's reasonably not possible to remove uh, enough tumor, then we will do a biopsy, chemotherapy first, and not radiotherapy to preserve the cognition. And we will see if we can induce this uh, shrinkage, also according to the fact that it's uh, oligo versus uh, astrocytoma and so on and so on. And finally, I will just propose surgery only when uh, the tumor will stop to shrink. So that means that we will continue to give a chemotherapy six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, speaking about temozolomide first, of course, to preserve the quality of life, until the plateau. And when we will be at the plateau, then we will propose to the patient, if functionally feasible, to operate him or at that time. So this is the principle of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, once again, which is not a scoop for other organs, but for the brain, yes. Speaking about the first question, definitely each patient is different. So that means that uh, in order to select the best timing to reoperate after a first surgery with incomplete resection, it will depend, first of all, of the natural history of this disease. And as you know, speaking about low-grade glioma, you can have a growth rate about one millimeter per year to eight millimeter per year. So that means that more the tumor will come back quickly, less effective will be the mechanisms of your plasticity. And maybe we will be obliged to give chemotherapy first before to reoperate. If the tumor is growing very slowly, you have time in front of you in order to induce plasticity. Secondly, it will depend, uh, of course, on the quality of life of the patient and cognitive assessment. I mean, uh, if the patient totally recover with uh, uh, um, perfect scores on the cognitive assessment a few years later, despite uh, the rigors of the tumor, that means uh, that uh, you can reoperate. If the the patient is not perfect, especially because the tumor is migrating along the Y matter tract while migrating very slowly. You have some difficulties sometimes to reoperate, and you could prefer to give chemotherapy first, and so on and so on. I will not detail everything. I published recently a paper about all these parameters, uh, and there are so numerous that it's a very big equation to solve with each patient because finally the most important will be the wishes of the patient. Nonetheless, to make this long story short, in median, in my experience, I have the habit to reoperate between four to five years, but definitely it could be two years later or 10 years later. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, so since in the interest of time, I would like to close this session. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank all the speakers for the wonderful lectures. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.